How confident are you to go into the darker chambers of your mind? Um, do you know what anxiety is? Do you know what just some sort of generalized anxiety that you're not sure what the source is? Do you know what that feels like? Um, and even better, better, do you know what chronic anxiety is? Do you know what it means to, from the moment you open your eyes in the morning till the moment you go to bed, and perhaps even in your sleep, you've got the jitters, and it's a it's a particularly frightening kind of jitters, in that it casts a pall of gloom, doom, and emptiness over everything. Um, <clears throat> I talked a lot about depression, but uh, I know a thing or two about anxiety as well. And it's a interesting debate which one is worse, and really, when you get to sort of the summit of both of them, they start to really resemble each other an awful lot. Um, one is sort of a jittery sort of low, and the other one is a sort of catatonic or cataleptic low. But at the end of the day, the end result, I think, is the same. You're, you're kind of neutralized as a human being. That which is has most terrified you in your life, or that which you most feared has come upon you, as Dante said in the Inferno. That's anxiety, I think. Um, just existing is a torment to you. Um, I think we all have bouts of anxiety. I think it's part of being human. But if you've actually seen or experienced what it's like to actually be more or less in a constant state of anxiety. You know that there are differing levels of anxiety and you realize when you sort of start to get really bad anxiety that you, you'd, I think you'd underestimate it just how bad it can get and you can underestimate it and forget how bad it can get after it's receded because it's, you know, it's one of those things that tricks you a bit and you sort of think, well, that wasn't real and you know, you end up in this sort of mind game with yourself, trying to determine what had happened. And the main, the, I think, the main preoccupation or the main habit of most people when they get out of something like that is to blot it out. Um, perfectly understandable response, unless, of course, you've got a particularly intractable kind that will keep coming back, and you just keep forgetting it and keep allowing yourself in, to get ambushed. Now, a lot of people, I think, who've suffered from chronic anxiety kind of, I would say, surrender to it. Um, <clears throat> in other words, they allow themselves to be overpowered to it, uh, by it. It's not It's not the, the surrender, as we hear in love songs, surrendering to romance or surrendering to the moment or surrendering to love or whatever, throwing yourself at the divine mercy of the universe or whatever. It's more of a, along the lines of, holy shit this is insurmountable and it's horrible beyond imagining. I think that cumulatively, if you've suffered from chronic anxiety for a very long period of time, that can happen to you. You can start to say, this at bottom is what life and existence is. And because you've already developed this kind of habit of deluding yourself, of trying to blot it out of your memory, sort of thinking, well, that was bad and I just don't want to think about it, I think you develop the habit of mind that <clears throat> there is anxiety and then there's delusion and there's no other option there. Um, Peter Zopfe seems to think that. Uh, people like Thomas Ligotti seems to think that. Um, my favorite, Lovecraft, just, uh, you know, he seems to feel that way. H.P. Lovecraft. Um, a lot of the what I would call life-denying philosophies. And again, I, I get in trouble when I say this because um, when I say life-denying philosophies because I lump in things like Jainism and Buddhism and Christianity to a certain extent and Islam and all of these ones that say that <clears throat> there's an ideal out there which is better than this. Um, they kind of posit the same view that the world is just a place of sorrow and misery and and the best thing to do is to plan your exit from it. Um, I think that that is at bottom a, f a species of life denial and a species of hmm, life isn't worth living. 
um, and it's only made possible by an ideal. Uh, you get, say, what I would call an extreme case, like the Gnostics or the or the Jains, even or the modern antinatalists, who you know just sort of say that there is delusion and then there's anxiety, or there's delusion and then there's horror or something like this, suffering, whatever. Um, now that is a very, very, very powerful current in hum in the human experience. I think when you start to just think about what reality might actually be at bottom, what existence is, you end up with, of course, angst. You end up with, ah, you know, Edvard Munch's fav famous painting. So, uh, in that case, you um, interruption there. In that case, you sort of say, okay, then getting drunk your whole life or um, getting addicted or getting palliated some way or another by whatever it is, uh, whatever it is that blots out this reality, whatever it is that keeps your mind, as Lovecraft says, from correlating all of its uh, various uh, discoveries, uh, that is all that there is to life. Um, <clears throat> because there's nothing that you can do to stand up in the face of chronic, intractable, and severe anxiety. I'd say that anxiety is worse than the worst suffering you can come up with, because, again, there's, we can't really suffer anything that our bodies aren't equipped to absorb, up, and, up to and including death by slow torture. Um, what it is I find that we most are most averse to is the fear of it all is the terror, the unknown terror of it all, where the next blot of anxiety is going to attack. Or we also fear things that are going to make us drop our guard. We fear things that are going to try and say, no, 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 things are good, because we know that due to our past attempts to blot out anxiety, that just made the whole thing worse. Uh, it allowed us to get ambushed. Um, you know, the the sort of thing that you learn as an adolescent when you fall, fall, when you fall blindly in love very easily and reality smacks you in the face one way or another. Either you get get the girl and find out she's just a human being or you don't get the girl and you're crestfallen, heartbroken, etc. That's, you know, letting your guard down and allowing yourself to get stabbed in your most vulnerable place, emotionally speaking. But most people sort of get through that. Most people sort of, you know, I guess that's puppy love. Um, but again, that you can sort of see the fear of this happening, the fear of letting your guard down um, throughout a great deal of quote-unquote life-denying or idealistic philosophies or points of view or whatever. We must um, somehow escape from this horror called existence. Um, I mention the herd, and I get in trouble with that. And then the way that I would use the herd is only in the Nietzschean sense, in that it's just the way that an eccentric sees the world. Everyone else is in lockstep with each other, but you see that they're actually, in your view of things, they're just all deluding themselves, and they've got this collective delusion that they've all agreed on. Again, Zopfe comes to mind, but, you know, Maya and Hinduism and all this kind of thing come, you know, it's the same approximation. The idea that all of this is somehow real, that... Uh, that all that we're doing matters and that it's going somewhere and all that kind of thing. That's the that's another big, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's a delusion, but it's a almost a collective solipsism. It's a collective idea that we can sort of force reality to be what we want it to be. A lot of people say that that's what the Islamic world essentially does, but they just do it in a more blatant way than the West does. They've created this mythology that says everything makes sense, everything will work out, everything's wonderful, and will kill you if you challenge that. <laughs> um, that's not a very fair thing to say about Islam, but that's, you know, a, a lot of people see it that way. I'm just sort of uh, explaining the caricature of what, how Islam is viewed in the West. Um, <clears throat> there is, say some people, another way of looking at the world. Rather than surrendering to its horrors and becoming jaded and bitter and you know, resigned to everything and say this is all just a waste of time. Um, or deluding yourself with the Olympic Games or your favorite TV show or um, baseball games on Wednesday night, 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, church on Sunday, all that kind of thing. 
rather than those two options, delusion or anxiety, or I guess the third option would be um, complete um, surrender to everything and say life is just a horrible, in, in, you know, un insoluble mess. There's another way. Um, I'm not going to say that it, it, it's it's going to work. Uh, it's what I do. I don't like to, as most people know, I don't like to really talk about it all that much. Not because I have anything I'm embarrassed about it or it's personal. Just when you start talking about it, it sounds stupid um, or insane even. And that's the phenomenon of Tantra. And this is my view of Tantra, and I'm self-taught in this. And there's any number of different schools of Tantra. And if I say this is Tantra, then somebody else is going to have a good idea as to how I'm wrong and everything. But anyway, this is my view of what it is. It's to absorb and to take into yourself willingly all the horror of the world, along with all the good in the world, the better to actually own it, thereby to control it, thereby to change it. Um, that, at bottom, is what, to me, Tantra is. And I, I just use the word Tantra because it's convenient, because that's what that's the Eastern or Indian or Hindu view of what Tantra is. It's essentially a means of, instead of escaping from the wheel of existence, the escaping from um, the pointless, endless grind of existence, the idea is to sort of enjoy riding that hamster wheel that is existence. You know, there's something about, something like the, you know, when you're consciously trying to bring about circumstances like you read about in the myth of Sisyphus, you actually want to say, this is fun, what I'm doing. <clears throat> this is why I guess people say that when they hear the term Tantra in India, they go, oh, crazy, because why, what's so fun about being on a hamster wheel for eternity? Okay. I'll ask you this, what's so horrible about it? Ah, okay, now that kind of brings things out into sharper relief. What's so bad about being on a hamster wheel for all eternity? Look into that. Really, truly examine what it is about that that is terrible, that is so horrifying. What is so terrible, so nightmarish about Sisyphus's life or his existence, I guess? The repetitiveness, the futility, the boredom, boredom, imagine the boredom, the um, effort that he has to ex expend, the pain in the ass factor, the fear, the idea that this goes on forever, it just never stops, <laughs> like, uh, uh, you know, and yet uh, they, the myth of Sisyphus says that it's entirely possible to be happy doing that. To me, that's what Tantra is. It's how do you take existence, take control of your own existence from the inside, not the external stuff, the external stuff that you can't control, but from the inside, the value that you place on everything. How do you alter the value of things? And I'm talking about value in and of itself, the value that you place on everything. How do you change the essential value of everything? Well, to me, the only way that you can do it, I guess, is something along the lines of meditation, controlled meditation, controlled mental manipulation, or whatever. Um, a lot of tantric imagery is horrifying. I, you know, you go to Tibet or you go to northern India or whatever, and you see all these ferocious gods eating people alive and terrible imagery of catastrophic disasters that befall entire galaxies and things like this. It's loaded with this. Uh, but it's not that people are obsessed with this kind of thing, who are tantrics. It's just that they want to allow the fact that that could happen into their view of existence. Um, and they want to take control of that fact. Let's say that you're Jewish and it's 1935 and you can foresee what's coming and you also understand that there's more or less no chance of you getting out of this mess. Okay, so you live in horror forever and then you get gassed and you die. Or... You try something else. You try to say, this is my fate, I can't do anything about it. But I've got another few years to live. Do I want to live in hellish anxiety? Or do I want to live and say, well, here it comes. 
Under the circumstances that are beyond my control, I have very few choices, but such choices as I do have, I'm going to use to the max. Again, Epictetus comes to mind. He was a maimed slave, and he managed to, you know, he allegedly made his life perfectly enjoyable and, and worth living and everything. Um, <clears throat> that, to me, is Tantra, is you're constantly manipulating your own experiences and your own value assessments of everything in life to sort of see the other side of things. It has a lot to do with you know, my, my, one of my favorite tools, Anakantavada, Syadvada, and all these sorts of things where it says that there's any, different, any number of different ways that you can view anything, any number of points of view. And there's the point of view that says, you know, getting gassed in Auschwitz is horrible. There are other ways to see that sort of thing. Start talking about that, though, and watch what happens. Start saying that, okay, let's say that it is my fate, that I am, you know, I know that this is coming, that it's going to end with me getting, you know, dying horribly, etc. Um, and that I can't escape it. Okay, what can I do now? Do I just scream and panic for the rest of my existence? Okay, I'm sure that that's what most people would do. Is there another way to deal with this? <laughs> I'm not saying that anybody else has um, any obligation or that I'm encouraging anybody to do this. I'm simply explaining a point of view. I'm simply explaining how I approach the horrors of existence. Um, or how I would like to approach them, I guess. Um, and the main tool that one uses, and it's certainly the main tool that I get from my studies of Tantra, is love. You love that which horrifies you. <laughs> um, you love that which is the most terrifying thing. Um, you love that which is inevitable, powerful, inexorable. You love the anxiety that you feel. You love it. But you must love it in a certain way, because there's love and then there's love. You know, we know how love can become toxic again. Anakandavada, looking at everything from every conceivable angle. You can see that there's a toxic way to love something, but you can see that there's a healthy way to love something. There's a healthy way to love, and there's a toxic way to love. Well, I think there's a healthy way to suffer, and there's a toxic way to suffer. Um, and again, healthy and toxic are relative terms, because, you know, there's good health, and then there's bad health, and then there's good toxicity and bad toxicity, etc., etc. Again, you're sort of blurring all values, and you're understanding the fact that, ultimately, it's you who's placing value on absolutely everything. The universe simply is. Um, that which you can't change is that which, you, that which you can't change. End of story. There's really no point in worrying beyond that. If you can't change it, but people will worry, of course. So my view is, what do you do with that worry? What do you do with that horror? Well, you put it in its proper place. You come to terms with it. You overcome it, if that's the word you want to use. You, you alter its fundamental value, I suppose. And again, that, to me, that's what meditation can do. It's withdrawing into the first-person observer point of view of existence itself, more or less in real time, all the time, and you're trying to alter your experience of everything that is coming at you, everything that is coming at you through that information stream that Pyro talks about. You can't change the fact that there's, a, there's an asteroid about to hit you right between the eyes, but you can change how you experience it. Now, I'm not, when I say you, I'm not saying you. I'm not telling anyone to do this. In fact, I would probably discourage anyone from doing this, uh, unless you're in it for the long haul, and I've been into this more or less for 30 years. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not really saying that this is a valid point of view for everybody or a valid path to tread. In fact, in most traditions, that's called the left-handed view of things, where everything that is profane, everything that is what we call evil, everything that is terrifying, everything that is horrible, is that which you seek to love. Um, instead of trying to run away from the devil, you're trying to turn around, look at the devil, and offer him your hand and say, look, 
we don't necessarily have to be antagonistic here. I'm not. I don't want to be what you are, but I understand that you are what you are for a reason. You're part of the reality of existence. So instead of me hating you and everything, I will love you. And again, devil, whatever you want to call that. Chronic anxiety is my word for, or is what I would call, what most people call the devil or Satan or whatever. Um, you want to accept that and overcome it, or not even overcome it and kill it, but overcome it and absorb it into yourself. Um, it's part of existence. Now, what do you make of existence in and of itself? Well, you can we can make of our own existence whatever we want to. So in that sense, I would say Tantra is the ultimate freedom. Now, read about Tantra if you want. You'll find it the most bizarre sort of <laughs> uh, philosophy out there. Uh, and the more you try to explain it to people, the more people just go, mm, you know, and, you know, which is kind of why it's a bit difficult to explain what you're talking about. But in a nutshell, what it means to me, yoga, hatha yoga, where I train my body to respond to whatever impulse, whatever I want it to do, it does, you know, I want to control it. I want to understand what it means to breathe. I want to understand what it means to have a heart that beats that I can't do anything about or it doesn't feel like I can do anything about. I want to understand what it feels like to be in complete control of every part of my body, etc., etc., etc. Same thing for your mind. Same thing for your emotions. Same thing for everything. You want to control everything that you are. You want to sort of understand that something is in control of some part of what you're experiencing. Which is why I kind of steadfastly refuse to say that I'm deterministic or I believe in free will. I'm more of a determinist than I am a free will type, but again, there just seems to be so much evidence that we do have what the Greeks called prohiresis, which is, you know, the faculty of choice. Um, we have some options, however minute they may seem, uh, those small options that we do have, i.e. to love or to hate things, uh, ends up being actually a bigger option than any of the other ones. And that is what, to me, Tantra is. is to, it's a means of teaching us, or for us to teach ourselves, or to so mold ourselves, to love, accept, and expect, and I guess ultimately enjoy everything about our own existence. Not an easy thing to do. In fact, <laughs> plenty of people would say that it's the most foolish and futile way to live because you're never going to achieve that. Yeah. No, but um, what else is there to do with life? <laughs> really, think about it. What else is there to do? Uh, instead of being horrified by the sheer futility of engaging in something like this, ask yourself that realistic question. Got a better idea? I want to go fly a kite or you know, uh, get into a bar fight down at the corner bar or something? Or you know, work yourself to death at a job, then you tip over and on your deathbed go, oh, uh, that was a waste of time. Like, What else is there to do with existence other than to learn to enjoy it? Learn to be at peace with it. Learn to love it. What else is there? Well, some people say that the thing we can do is to end it. I don't think we can end existence. <laughs> uh, I don't know how... that That's almost impossible even to wrap one's mind around. I can see how... Like there was a fellow, uh, Mystic of the Sands, a while back, who had an idea called Amor Vacui, the love of the void. There's some something somewhat Buddhistic or, I guess... Um, call it um, um, gnostic about that kind of thing, that non-existence is wonderful. It's There's a powerful strain of that in like Benatar or whatever, uh, Ligotti, definitely, non-existence is bliss. Um, but something will always exist. I think that existence simply is. Um, and it's, you know, I don't think that we're going to do anything about that. So now we exist. Now what? Well, get busy living or get busy dying. What does it mean to live and what does it mean to die? There's a good thought. Eh? Do you want to spend your entire life dying or do you want to spend your entire life living? It's funny, eh? We've got that choice whether we like it or not. 